I follow the ambidoxine thing from a lay level. The cage could take advantage of shape, size, or charge distribution. Actually, all three. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you. Well, give me, give me, give me three minutes. Give me three minutes. Twelve seconds later. It's not a party until we get the whiteboard, right? For the past 25 years, the Japanese have spent a lot of money and a lot of time on trying to figure out how to harvest uranium from seawater. There are billions of metric tons of uranium dissolved in all of the oceans that we have on this planet. But there's a challenge. <laughs> it's diffuse. As a matter of fact, the diffusion is on the order of carbon dissolved, right? So it's very diffuse, it's very scarce. You need an ultra low energy method of trying to scoop up the uranium. Now the uranium, I drew it like this because I like to think about charges. But the geometry of the uranium UO2 dication, dication 2 plus, a BMW motorcycle engine, right? It's horizontally opposed. They're literally vibrating. It's like carbon dioxide, right? It's actually identical to carbon dioxide. The only difference between these two is that this is highly charged. This is a neutral molecule. But they still geometrically have the two wings, the two oxygens. And let me tell you, these two oxygens are a pain in the ass to pull off. Whether it's carbon or uranium, it doesn't matter. Oxygen is very difficult and therefore very costly. One advantage of the UO2 dication, it has a formal charge. Let's take a closer look at the cage, the thing that's going to receive the dication. This is in seawater. All sorts of dynamics are happening. The strength of this lies in the fact these electrons around here can move around. So these are called resonance structures. Now I'm combining them all in one shot here, okay? So I've got formal charges here. But what this dotted line represents is a distribution because I can draw another resonance structure here. I can lose a proton and I can get a negative charge. And this cage, there's enough electron distribution to be able to fit here. This thing is literally horizontally opposed just like a BMW motorcycle engine. They're horizontally opposed. This sweeps in and it sticks there. It sticks because this literally goes like this and fits right in. Now, they do wiggle. But what matters more than wiggle? Charge. Yeah. Charge. That's what matters more. That the electrons have a profound influence on the nuclear spins. And using nuclear magnetic resonance, we can kind of listen to what they're telling us. Kind of like a nuclear whisperer or whatever you want to call it, right? That reflects the electronic structure or how the atoms are bound to one another in three-dimensional space around each atom. Any window into the molecular structure, either a through space or a through bond influence matters. It gives the scientists more information about the local electronic structure that surrounds these atoms because scientists need to understand how this fits in there and whether or not there's any exchange, electronic exchange, chemical exchange, spin exchange, any kind of exchange between the caging atoms and the thing that is being caged. So is this polymer, is it an expensive thing to make? No, it's cheap as shit. It's great. <laughs> this can go millions of units in either direction. Oh, it's it's a long long. Long. Yes, because at the end of the day, what are the Japanese planning on doing? Hanging these nets off of trawling ships or boats okay. in the Pacific. Okay. Kilometers long. A kilometer can gather a hell of a lot of this. Exactly one of these can fit into exactly one of these. So you know it's a molar ratio. It's a now a one-to-one -one ratio. So is that better than just putting the seawater through a pipe? Which is better? Yeah. Spending a bunch of money on a pump and pumping millions of liters or simply dragging off the back of a boat? I would argue that the latter of the two is actually correct. This process 
you can time it. If I know precisely down to the gram of how many kilometers of amidoxine that I'm dragging off the back of my boat, scientists have already measured how long this process occurs. So I'm going to know how long I hang my net out to grab a precise number of UO22+. Wow. So my original question was shape, charge, and size. So we got shape and charge. How about size? Are there any competitors to, to fit in there? Ah, this is kind of special. I know for a fact that all of the salt that's dissolved in there, magnesium 2 plus, lithium 1 plus, they're spheres. This is a sphere of distributed charge. This is a sphere of distributed charge, right? Calcium 2 plus also in seawater, right? Let's talk about the anions now. What are the anions? What are the negatively charged things that are in there? Well, there's bromine one minus, also a sphere. Chloride anion, also a sphere. Would spheres fit into something like this? No. Look at the size of this sucker. You've got one, two, three, four. I know how long these bonds are. They're in the roughly 1 to 1.8, maybe 1.9 angstrom distance. And this is a triple bond, so it's shorter. It's more contracted, right? This is sp2 hybridized, but this is a single bond. So this is here, a little bit longer. So I know what this cage looks like. And part of this cage is actually stable. These triple bonds aren't letting rotation or libration occur. This is librating like a son of a bitch. Like this is, this is moving, right? 10 to the four times per second, this is spinning. But so what? There's your shape and there's the size. We got one, two, three, four atoms that are directly involved in the capture of the UO2 dication. That's why. So is this a polymer that can be extruded like plastic? Okay. Like I said, kilometers long, dude. So the, whole, the whole material is going to be the same. Metric tons. Okay. Think about it. You're basically creating a net that is the size of like a commercial fishing trawler net. But instead of fish, you're grabbing this sucker. So they bring the net back to shore and it goes to a concentrating plant? That's my understanding now. You're, you're raising a very good point, here's why. Because of the facility of the nitrogen, perhaps more importantly, the nitrogen and then the oxygen to a lesser extent, I can change these chemistries very, very easily because they readily accept and shed protons depending on the overall pH. I don't need a pH of one. I need a pH of like six to protonate this. That's not a big deal. That's, that's, that's way less acidic than lemon juice. There's way more uranium known to exist in the world's oceans than there is on land. And you don't need a bulldozer. You don't need a bulldozer. You need a net. And, you don't need and so that's the attraction of, of ocean-bearing uranium cations, or dications in this case. So in your humble opinion, would you say that uh, uranium is a renewable resource? Absolutely, 100%. I'm, it's on my Twitter feed. Nuclear is renewable energy. Nuclear is renewable energy. There's enough of this stuff in the oceans to power us for the next 100,000 years without burning another gram of fossil fuels. It's that simple. It's super simple.